Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Boutineau tasting. We are doing this in lieu of the fact that there is, uh, unfortunately, no, no trade tasting. So um, we've picked out 12 wines, which we uh, hope you're all going to love as a, a snapshot of what the, what the Boutineau range is and what we think um, is going to be great for 2021. Um, we've got uh, six different producers with us, with us here today who we're going to run through the wines of, um, also a video from uh, our uh, wine man on the ground in, in New Zealand and Catalina Sounds. So um, yeah, we're really looking forward to, to doing all that. We're hoping, we're fingers crossed that the technology works. We've tested it. It seems like it's, uh, it's going to go okay. And um, we're, we're looking forward to getting into trying some wines and, and talking with some producers about their story, something that we've certainly missed and, uh, and something that I think that you probably all have as well. Uh, my name's Mike Best. I'm a, a master of wine, work here at Boutineau. I look after uh, some of the customers in, in the south of England in the independence team. And I'm here with Andy Falk, um, who looks after some of the customers in and around um, the, the, the northwest. And we are um, yeah, going to be running through this, this tasting today. So I'm going to be talking with um, some of the, the, the winemakers and Andy's my right-hand man, keeping us, on, uh, keeping us on track in terms of time and uh, also going to be keeping an eye out for any questions that come in. So if you do have any questions uh, on any of the wines as, as, as we go through the tasting, feel free to ask those and uh, where we can do, we will try to answer them. It might not be possible because we are um, running quite a tight schedule, but we're hopeful that we'll be able to um, answer them as we go along. Or if not, we'll, we'll follow up with you, with you afterwards. I think uh, we all know each other pretty well, so but we'll be very happy to do that. Um, but um, we, um, no, no need to, to delay. We are going to jump into trying our first wine. So um, it's a bit of a tour around the world and we're gonna uh, go first of all to see um, JD down in South Africa. So he is uh, the Boutonet winemaker in South Africa. And uh, JD, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mike, how are you? Yeah, very well, thank you, very well. So um, we are gonna jump uh, straight in and uh, I wanted to, and um, ask you uh, to tell us about the, the Wild House Shenin. So uh, what do we need to know about the, about the new 2020 Wild House Shenin? Um, Mike, just a quick word on, on Bilderberg um, um, in Franschhoek in the, in the Western Cape of South Africa. Um, our philosophy of winemaking is working with old vines um, like this, um, the Shenin Blanc also in, in the Wild House. Um, I think our biggest challenge and a most exciting project that we work with is Wild House because we need to apply this philosophy that we have with our other Wilderberg wines. We um, need to apply this to a bigger scale, which is Wild House, which is the house wine of Wilderberg. So grapes is from unirrigated vineyards um, in the mostly in the pole area. Um, so very low yield, super concentrated. We then naturally ferment it um, in stainless steel tanks, and then we keep it as long as possible on the lease. And I usually say um, we, we believe in lazy winemaking, so we really spend time in the vineyard making this wine. As soon as it comes to the, to, to the winery, it's literally hands off and the wine makes itself. And it's also, I think for us, we quite believe in, um, we need to, um, it's a sense of place. So when you drink this wine, you, you need to think and go back to this amazing vineyard that we work with um, in the Paul area. Absolutely. And I think that really, you apart uh, from a commercial point of view that um, this is not a, a wine that's necessary from uh, from some of those bigger bulk uh, areas but it's still at a very accessible price point so um, the uh, what's the philosophy in terms of how that wine then will will taste everyone's got the the, the, the wine uh, ready to taste but what is it that you're really trying to draw out um, during your your, your winemaking process well in the winemaking process um, we we like as we well, if you want to get technical, we don't we don't ferment too too um, clear. We ferment slightly higher. It's just giving that texture, but also capturing the freshness in the in the wine. And you have this ni nice aromatic, almost like a peach skin um, on on the nose. And then um, after fermentation, like I said, we try to keep it as much as uh, as long as possible prior to bottling on the least, um, giving it a stir once a month, um, and then into the bottle just with a coarse filtration. And there's no oak on this wine, is that right? Yes, no, it's unoaked. Okay, so I think that's a really, um, you know, an absolutely delicious thing in terms of style, but 
Um, it's something which you can, it's easy drinking. that has got plenty of that sort of uh, fruit structure without being too sort of floral or pear drops or, or, or things that maybe people might even think that when they pick up a bottle at this kind of price point, that that's the, what they're going to get. Actually, what they're getting is quite a serious wine with, with texture, with the freshness, as you say, that can work um, really well with, uh, with, with food pairing. Um, and why, obviously, Shenin is, is South Africa's great variety, but what is it that you like uh, about working with Shenin and, and why does it help you this wine? Well, I think for us, especially at this price point, this is definitely Shenin is your go-to varietal. It just over delivers um, immensely on, 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 on each price point, but especially a year. And we've got this amazing old vineyards um, all around us um, that we work with. And just getting all these vineyards together and, and producing a wine like this in, in the style that we want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that, that absolutely makes sense. And um, so within the, the Wild House range, of course, um, it's not just it's not just Shenin. So could you just give us a quick uh, brief run through of some of the other wines in the, uh, in, the in the range? OK, um, yeah, so like, you know, we're still in the beginning of our story at Wildenberg. Um, so with the Wild House, we're trying to focus only on Shenin and Shiraz at the moment. Once again, the reason um, for the Shiraz is the same as the Shenin. Um, I think uh, Shiraz in South Africa is one of those varietals over delivering um, at this price point. But uh, same philosophy on all the wines from Wild House up to our Wildenberg White and Red. Mm -hmm. So it's... Um... It's, it, I think it's you know really exciting to see that you you take that uh, that philosophy. I mean, it makes sense for for the uh, the Wildeberg estate that you can make um, the wines like this. But um, in terms of that hands off approach, the lazy winemaking, as you like to say, um, but it definitely it definitely sets you apart in terms of um, in terms of what's what's happening there. I think. And um, where was the idea for this project uh, conceived? What was the what was the thought process behind that for you? Sure. Um, I think we, it's not just for me. I think it was, we were quite a team sitting around a table five years ago deciding where are we going and I really not trying to make another shin and not trying to make another Shiraz. It's really going out there, work with vineyards that we want to work with, take this grapes back to the, to the winery and um, produce a wine that we will drink with our friends um, over weekends when we're watching South Africa beat England in the rugby or in, exactly. maybe in the cricket as well. So I think for us, um, yeah, definitely it's a, it's a wine that we're proud of. Um, and it's a wine that we drink, I wanna, wanna, don't wanna say every night, but uh, mostly <laughs> um, most nights in the week. And, and yeah, and it's just a wine to enjoy with your friends. If you're on the couch, having a bri or wherever you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. And um, What's some of the, the feedback that you've uh, that you've had from uh, from distant different customers about about the wine? What are sort of the things that people say about it? Do you think? Well, I think the first thing is it's um, definitely um, like I said. If you look at the price point, it's definitely over delivering on, on the price point. When they taste it, it's like whoa, okay. So this is actually getting so much more for, um, for your buck, and that's exactly what we're trying to do. But also, it's not um, stylistically. It's it's, it's, it's slightly different. So it's slightly more textured. It's slightly more um, mouthfeel um, that you get, that you think you're going to get in a, in a wine um, at this price point. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, with you being the winemaker for wines like Wilderberg White, a wine that's only made uh, 900 bottles of, um, uh, how do you manage to deal with that philosophy and also uh, be able to make a wine at this level as well? It, it must be quite difficult to sort of jump between between one and the other, but um, how does that work for you? Well, I think that's the biggest challenge, definitely. But it's also, like I said earlier, it's, it's quite exciting. So if you work with Wildeberg White, you work with this ancient um, bush vines planted in 1905, you make 900 to say 2,500 bottles per year. So it's almost easier when you do that. So when you take that philosophy and be true to yourself and your customers, and you have to um, do it with your with, uh, wine like Wild House, it's slightly difficult, and but it's doable. And I think for us, um, the the first vintage in the bottle, the 2021, are slowly fermenting the natural fermentation, but it's looking good. And and we need we just need to stick to our guns. Absolutely. I mean, I I'm um, I think that sometimes we don't always appreciate the effort that goes into these wines um, because actually. I feel like um, the hard work is at this level, not necessarily always at the level where you have the, 
the icon wines and the estate wines where you've got the most amazing grapes that and the wine makes itself so that's the, that's the challenge i think it's brilliant to see um the this kind of wine where let's be honest this is the one that most customers are going to drink because it's that, that accessible price point and so on um but they really deliver in terms of in terms of the the quality and um, so it's it's encouraging for us you know out out, out on the road you know see seeing customers and knowing those wines are there. And um, maybe just as a, as a last question, if you were to, um, if, you, if you go to a restaurant and the table next to you ordered a bottle of Wild House Shenin, what would you absolutely love the person serving it to them to say about the wine? Shoot, Mike. Uh, I, got, I, got these, I got these difficult questions. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> Well, well this is an amazing wine. Please, uh, yeah, this is, no, I think, yeah, I, I just, uh, um, it's a very difficult question to answer. I, I think just say um, what, what, what we gave giving through is just, this is a, a nice example of a, a, a South African um, uh, Chenin Blanc over delivering. And it's just, like you said earlier, Chenin is such a diverse varietal, and especially with food as well. You can drink it on its own. You can drink it with a salad. You can drink it with curry. Uh, even with meat dishes, so I think um, I don't know if I'm answering your questions, but I, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. but I think it's definitely something that you can you can have with so much dishes um, at a restaurant. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think for a man who's surviving on about three or four hours sleep and uh, in the middle of harvest, you've done remarkably well for all the videos you've had to, to be on. So, uh, look, JD, we're going to let you get back to it um, and uh, get back in the cellar and uh, in the vineyard. And thanks very much for, for talking to us about Wild House Shenan, and, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, JD. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Bye-bye. Okay. okay. Um, now we are going to um, introduce uh, Craig. Uh, so um, Craig is our, uh, our man in, in the north of England, and uh, we're gonna, he's going to talk to us about um, our new organic Garvey. So Craig, hello. If you could, uh, yeah, just uh, give us a whirl. Hey, boys. Can you hear me? We can, hit, we can see you in here, yeah. Perfect, right, so today I've got this brand new um, Balivento Organic Garvey. So this is in your box, this is for you to taste later. Um, this is uh, from the commune um, Gavi de Tassarolo, it's a 2020. It's a new addition to the range and our first organic Garvey. Uh, it's from Araldica, so hand harvested. Um, take it down to the Labatastina winery where Carlo Monero works his magic. So typical Carlo opting for low temperature fermentation, controlled, extra time on lees. So the, the style here is uh, quite br bright but, but fleshy as well, um, you know, richer on the mid palate, I suppose. Um, it's kind of a great wine and, and a great all-rounder at the price in terms of it being organic as well, but it, it, it appeals to the Sauvignon Blanc crowd, I feel, quite often. Um, you've got that nice green citrus note going on, some sort of honeyed characters. Uh, but like I said, it is a little fleshy. There's a lovely minerality and, and the acidity is really integrated. So um, cracking all around by the glass list. Um, in terms of food pairings and things like that, it is... It is quite, quite open. You can throw a lot at it. Simple pastas, creamy pastas, seafood, poultry, salads. It's, it's, it's really quite broad. But like I said, it should be a cracking crowd pleaser and a lovely new addition. So I hope you all enjoy that later. Excellent. Yeah, thanks so much, Craig. And uh, that we're going we're gonna to whiz off onto our next speaker. But nice to hear from Craig. Um, I, I completely agree. I think that we've been um, you know, really successful with, with, with many, many um, Garvey's and I'm sure you're, you're familiar with, but that's um, another interesting new addition. So um, we are now, um, after, after move, uh, moving from uh, JD in South Africa, we're going to, to France um, to talk with Julien um, about La Fleur Solitaire, so our Cote de Rhone Blanc. So uh, Julien, good, uh, good afternoon. Hello, how are you? We're doing well, we're pleased to, we're pleased to be here and uh, pleased that, fingers crossed, things are, things are still working uh, technology-wise for the time being. So. Um, well, we're really excited to, um, to, to bring uh, to this tasting uh, La Fleur Solitaire. I think it's a really interesting wine and that um, maybe for, for people that don't know that it's Cote de Rhone Blanc is a, is a small part. Obviously, mostly it's the red wines that people know about. Um, but um, yeah, if you could introduce the wine and, and tell us a little bit about the philosophy, that would be great. Uh, the, uh, Fleur Solitaire, it's a, it's a Cote du Rhone white. 
uh, make uh, make in two parts of, of the Rhone Valley. Uh, one part it's in the north of the Rhone Valley, where I uh, I vinify the Grenache and the Viognier in the stainless steel tank, uh, because the blend in the in the first solitaire blend you have uh, uh, six variety, and uh, and two different terroir. Uh, one terroir is in the north of the Rhone Valley, where I vinify Viognier and Grenache. 50% Grenache, 20% Viognier, fermented in stainless steel tank. And another part in the south of the Rhone Valley with a more uh, sandy, sandy terroir, where I vinify in barrel 30% of the blend, Roussan, Marsan, Claret, and Bourboulin. Uh, why this choice? Uh, because uh, uh, I fermented the Grenache and Viognier in stainless steel tank to increase the finesse keep the maximum of freshness. And um, we also, uh, I forget to explain, we, we pick the grape very early in the morning, press it directly and make the fermentation in cold temperature to extract a maximum of on fruit. And for the second part, uh, Roussan, Marsan, Claret and Bourboulin, fermented in barrel, it's quite similar picking uh, with a machine but uh, we fermented in barrel. Why? Because with the Roussan, Marsan, Claret, and Bourboulin, uh, I'm looking for more the body and the texture to the wine. And I fermented that in barrel to rise this complexity and to rise the body. When you test the wine, you have in first uh, a, a fruit sensation. Uh, the oak arrived a little bit late after the, the, the tasting, it's that I'm looking for. I don't want that the oak mask or hide all the freshness and the aromatic in, in, in the wine. I'm just looking for to have a wine uh, with a nice complexity and uh, with the oak to help the body and the texture of, of the wine. Because like you know, in the south of France, uh, our problem is the acidity. And for that, I, we need to be very accurate with, uh, with the date of harvest. And uh, I balance the low or the high acidity with, uh, with the oak to arrive to the perfect balance in my wine. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a, you know, it's a, thank you very much for that run through. It's uh, again, something that you can't get necessarily from a page or reading it, uh, you need to, hear from the winemaker, the story and the complexity that goes into making that wine. Um, what do the different grape varieties bring to the final blend? Could you just talk to us about the characteristics of a few of the, the six different grape varieties you say? Yes, six, six grape variety because it's a, it's a principal uh, variety of the Rhone Valley. Viognier uh, uh, help to uh, the aromatic and I picked the Viognier very early to have the the peach flavor and not the abricot flavor. Because uh, I think when you arrive to the abricot flavor in the beginning of the, of the life of the wine, you are a little bit so ripe. And in one valley, you, you need to be careful with, uh, with that. Uh, Grenache for the fresh, freshness, the elegance and the finesse. After Roussan, Marsan, Claret and Bourboulin, often I, I, I say, all the grape in the same time because it's also the same moment where we pick the grape. Mm -hmm. and it's the blend of all this grape uh, in the barrel give uh, uh, the texture because Roussan Marsan are quite similar. Uh, it's a, a white variety with a, with a body, uh, with the aromatic. It's less, less, you have less finesse than the Grenache and, and the Viognier. Uh, you have the finesse on the claret uh, and the bourboulin, but it's a, a light variety. It's for that we pick all together. Mm -hmm. that, that makes sense. And uh, yeah, again, amazing to, to hear um, all those different elements that you are putting together sort of piece by piece. For me, uh, what I think is really exciting about this wine in the, in the, in the marketplace in, in the UK is that if you look at the prices of things like uh, Bordeaux Blanc and certainly and White Burgundy and other classic Sancerre, say other classic French white wines, these are much more expensive. Um, and this is uh, very accessible in terms of price, but really delivering um, some, some excellent quality. Um, 
So this comes from the, the Keran estate of, of Boutineau. Um, and uh, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about that estate for people who haven't been. Uh, yeah, yes, and, and I missed something on, on the white wine in the Rhone, and, and I think it's important, sorry, Mike, to, to, to say, uh, in the white wine in the Rhone Valley, we don't make the second fermentation, because you speak about yeah. uh, Bourgogne, Sancerre, uh, etc., and I missed to, uh, to explain that. It for that uh, we are different in the Rhone and in the south of France, when you test a white wine, if you compare with a Burgundy or, or Sancerre, we don't make the second fermentation. And like that, you have the, a pure fruit expression. Yes, I yeah, think it's, a, it's, a, it's the power of the, if the, it's a, not the power, the plus of yeah. the Rouen uh, white wine. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so yes, if you, just, if you could just speak uh, just a few words about uh, about the, the Keran estate and uh, Domaine Boutineau and, and, the, and the, this, the story behind the behind the wines, maybe for the, the customers who don't know, that would be great. Yeah, but here I, I am in the cellar, in, in the shop uh, in Keran. It's a little bit cold. It, for that, I wear my jacket. Uh, uh, today, a lot of wind in Keran. It's crazy. Uh, a, a quick story of, of the domain. Uh, we celebrate the 10 year of, uh, of, uh, of the Domaine Boutineau uh, yesterday. Uh, uh, it's uh, uh, an estate in Keran. Keran, it's in the south of the Rhone Valley until Montelimar to Avignon, just to, to like that you have a, a, an idea of where is it. Uh, we are honored to 10 hectares in the Domaine Boutineau uh, in Keran. We pick all the grape by hand because it's a rule uh, in the Cru Keran. Uh, we vinify uh, on my back in the cellar, in the tronconicoque tank, and in the stainless steel tank. Uh, I vinify two principal cuvées here, uh, La Côte Sauvage and Lessis. Mm -hmm. uh, where, uh, and uh, what, can I, what, what can I say more? Well, that's a, that's, that's a, no, that's a, that's a, a good little introduction. I mean, uh, more, much more can be said, but um, yeah, we can we can we can talk about that certainly. And uh, just as a final question, um, we are moving now on to this is 2019, and we're moving on to some of the 2019 reds. Could you just say one or two words about the vintage? Because I heard that it's um, you know it, it was a, an excellent vintage. So maybe some some thoughts on that to close. Yes, 20, 20, 20, 2020, it's a, it's a good vintage. Yeah. No, sorry, 2019. Sorry, 2019 vintage. 19. Yes. 19 was uh, uh, a dry vintage with more concentration. If you, if I can compare with 20, you have more concentration, more, more power with uh, 19. If you compare with, with 20, uh, it, it was a good vintage, uh, a dry summer, uh, a dry harvest, uh, a concentrate tannin. Uh, difficult to have a, a, the, 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 the time to pick the grape was very important in 19 because more you're waiting in the south of France, uh, more you lose the juice and you need to find in white wine, like uh, Fleur Solitaire, the balance to have a juice and have a, a, a perfect ripeness and a perfect balance in, in the acidity. It was the challenge for us uh, in, in 19, a little bit less in 20, if we can compare the, the two vintage, yeah. but yes. yeah. Fantastic. Lovely. Well, thank you so much for your time and uh, for giving us a quick snapshot. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll um, definitely be tasting the wines more. And it's obviously a, a mainstay of our range. So uh, thank you very much, Julianne. And uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Um, so now we are going to jump down to Carl Walton uh, down in, in the southwest. So, uh, Carl, hello. And if you could uh, talk to us about your wine, please, that'd be great. Hi, Mike. Uh, yeah. Hi, everybody. So, yeah, I look after the, uh, the southwest and the south Midlands. And uh, apologies, I don't have a bottle of the wine with me, the, the France and Friends Gruner Veltliner. Uh, I did have a bottle, but I drank it last week. Uh, uh, and I didn't want to go rooting around my recycling bins at two o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon uh, to look for it. Uh, but what I can tell you is that it is a really lovely wine. I was really impressed with it. It's a new addition to our range this year. And it sits just below the Set Moser organic uh, Gruner Veltliner. And they both have their place. Um, last year, our Austrian sales were up 25%. So there's definitely a trend towards Austrian wine and in particular Grüner Veltliner. Uh, the France and Friends is a 
essentially a collaboration between Franz Turk, who uh, is the winemaker at Turk Winery. And with a few friends, he produces this wine, hence why it's called uh, France and Friends. And yeah, I just think it's value for money. It's as good as anything out there. Um, How do you see it working on lists, Carl? How do you see it working on lists? Well, I think, I think really now a lot of lists, you have to have interesting wines on there. I think, you know, don't, I don't think people want boring, just painted by numbers lists anymore. I think you've got to have some interesting bits and pieces on there. And Gruner Veltlina, it's interesting enough that people don't recognise it, but on the flip side, it has got a bit of a following as well. So I think it, it kills two birds with one stone. Um, and, and this, I just think it works so well with a, a variety of dishes. So um, with seafood or any Asian cuisine, it works really well. It's got that sort of spicy character to it. Uh, and yeah, I just I was just really impressed with the quality and and the value for money as well. I just yeah, it was, uh, it was great. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank yeah, thanks for that, Carl. Nice to do it. Nice to nice to talk to you. Um, we are going to move now, hopefully seamlessly, to a video. Uh, so this is a uh, me talking with uh, Catalina Sounds winemaker Matt Ward. Uh, obviously, it'd be a very unsociable time for him to be on this call now. So um, we're going to try to play that video now, and um, let's take it away. Hello everybody, I'm uh, Mike and I'm talking today with Matt Ward from Catalina Sounds all the way down in New Zealand. The connection is surprisingly good, uh, so we're hoping for, for good things. Um, I've just been enjoying a little glass of his uh, Catalina Sounds Marble Sauvignon Blanc 2020, so excited to get into it. Uh, Matt, if you could uh, introduce yourself please and uh, yeah, tell us a little bit more about Catalina Sounds. Sure, um, yeah, Matt Ward, obviously winemaker for Catalina Sounds. Um, I've been with the brand now for just over a year um, as a winemaker and absolutely loving my role here. Um, Catalina Sound started in, in 2005 um, with really a singular vision to produce uh, the best wines from Marlborough um, and championing the vineyards and, and where they come from. It started originally with our Sound of White Vineyard, which is in the Waihopai Valley in the southern end of the southern valleys itself. Um, so up on a terrace with sort of two distinct soil profiles through the vineyard. So on the lower end of the vineyard where most of our Sauvignon is planted, it uh, tends to be more siltier loams. And then on the upper part of the vineyard where we have Chardonnay, Pinot Gris and uh, Pinot Noir on the hill, tends to be the siltier loams but with a um, more interspersed with clay so we get more structure and, and weight and richness in the wines. Uh, the, the vineyard itself was completely bare land um, when it was purchased in 2005 and the first vintage was in 2007 um, and subsequent from there obviously um, you know, the, the brand has grown and to include you know a number of grower vineyards within the central valley as well so that we can really showcase the best regional expression of, um, of Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc. Mm -hmm. And um, within that, Matt, uh, what sort of style then are you are you aiming for? Because um, everyone uh, here will be familiar with uh, Marlborough Sauvignon as a hugely popular wine across the world and certainly in the UK market. Um, so what, what style are you, are you driving towards with Catalina Sounds? Uh, the style is, I, I talk about it as being Marlborough with a bit of an edge, but in saying that it's, you know, it is predominantly fermented in stainless steel, but we have 40% of it that traditionally comes from um, the Sound of White vineyard with our other grower vineyards to make up the blend itself. So you're getting a good regional expression. Mm -hmm. um, the style being, you know, has to have fruit purity and, uh, and regional expression, but it has to have nuance and it needs texture and, and weight and, and interest, um, you know, mm -hmm. outside of that traditional Marlborough Sauvignon. And I achieved that through fermenting some small parcels in large format oak as well plus, you know, a few larger format um, 500 litre barrels too. It's only generally a small amount because it can be uh, quite impactful. So that usually ends up being about 5% of the blend. Um, again, with those those really nice fresh stainless steel portions. So you're getting that Marlborough Sauvignon with a little bit of nuance, edge and texture. And again, dry too, um, so that, you, you know, you're really getting a completely unadulterated version um, of, of Marlborough Sauvignon and the best expression that you, that you can really get. On the uh, on the nose for me, um, 
it's um, it, it's um, I don't get really any perception of any of any of any oak characters, but certainly on the palette when I was trying earlier, it definitely uh, I see that um, that wonderful combination of a little bit of richness, but combined with that really uh, sort of zesty, bright acidity. So I think that works um, that works incredibly well. And um, as you said, if bone dry, so I think that that um, you know we're we're at a sort of a more premium price point with 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 Catalina Sounds. Um, and uh, one of the ways which I think it shows itself as being that more serious style. So um, absolutely, this is more suited, I think, to food pairing um, within, that, within that sort of foam dry style. I actually, because um, it's half past nine in the evening, I had uh, a glass of this with um, a piece of hake uh, for, my, for my tea earlier. So that went there with a little bit of butter. That was uh, absolutely fantastic. So uh, yeah, really lovely, really lovely pairing. Um, mm. And um, so I think it's it's great, but um, we're not the only people who who enjoy this. You've got a couple of good uh, press reviews for it recently as well, I think. Yeah, we have. Um, so the International Wine Challenge, which was delayed, but run back in November last year and uh, received 95 out of 100 points um, and a gold medal um, for that. Plus, we've had Bob Campbell down here in New Zealand as well uh, in January, tasted the wine and absolutely loved it. He also gave it 95 out of 100 um, gold medal, but also ranked it um, number four out of 71 Sauvignon Blancs in Marlborough as well. So a, a real testament, again, to that quality and, um, you know, and that regional expression and, and I guess that sound of white vineyard too, which is which comes through in the wine as well. We've also had... Um, we are also um, in the top seven of Gourmet Traveller wine um, for the new release, White Wines, uh, which has just been released this week as well. So we've had some fantastic um, fantastic accolades for the wine um, and really speaking to, um, I, I guess, the quality of it, not only of the wine, but also the 2020 vintage, which um, for, for all its challenges um, outside of winemaking and production, um, we really have probably haven't had a, a vintage of that quality for for such a long time um yeah so it's a it's a fantastic wine and from a fantastic vintage as well probably one of the best in i'd say the last last decade at least yeah amazing no it's well that's that's great to hear i think the wine uh, certainly stands up to it we had a we had a tasting of this wine uh, a few months back with the team and and everyone was um everyone was really impressed and i think that there's such a familiarity with with marlborough sauvignon blanc um that it, it is a bit like a film you've seen before, but actually mm. when you get something that's of this kind of quality, then um, it really shows you when you watch it again, you actually think, oh, I didn't actually notice that, or there was something there that I've missed. And um, I think this is uh, absolutely a, a, re a really good style to, to drive towards. Um, as you've um, been with the, with the, the winery relatively uh, relative short period of time, um, what are some of the things that have sort of impressed you or that you've um, you thought have been uh, really exciting about whether it's the vineyards or anything on the winemaking side um, that uh, since, since you've jumped in and joined the team? Um, yeah, no, great question. Uh, for me, it's it's really about the the diversity that I've, that I've got within Marlborough um, from the number of sites that we take fruit from. Obviously, Sound of White being, you know, it's it's at the top um, in that Southern Valleys piece. And because of where it's situated, we tend to have quite low yields. So um, really championing the quality from there. And yeah, the rest of the growers that we have around the, the valley as well, which are spread from, you know, the lower wire hour, um, which is those really sort of heavier soil types, um, you know, fairly poorly drained, but you get uh, quite a sort of punchy, herbaceous style of Sauvignon that comes from that area. Then we've got um, about four or five growers within the Central Valley as well. And Central Valley can extend from sort of the northern end of, of Rapara, um, which we, we call the Golden Mile, which tends to ripen first and earliest. Um, very stony, uh, very free draining, uh, very fertile soils in, in that central valley. And then the more southern you get from that, that area, you know, you tend to get into those siltier, sort of loamier soil types that, that tend to produce a bit more structure. You get a bit more of that sort of punchy passion fruit and those tropicals coming through as well. And then with our vineyard in the Southern Valleys, you, you tend to get more of those sort of, um, you know, alpine herbs and the like. So coming back to, you know, that diversity within the region and, you know, how many components that I actually have to work with, um, you know, come blending because for the winery, you know, we, we have uh, fantastic ability to be able to keep everything separate uh, as much as possible. 
so mm -hmm. you know and also play around with small parcels going into oak large format oak um, stainless steel and being able to split some of those blocks and you know whether it's um one that's using an indigenous yeast and and one with you know just a, a sort of an inoculated yeast as well just yeah. to see the the variances there so um that's one of the things i've loved about coming on board is um having having a vineyard in, in southern valleys um in waihopai mm -hmm. because it's such a special spot and then that, that diversity as well um but also you know the brand brand support that we have um you know we, we have we're probably the number one selling Sauvignon Blanc at a sort of premium price point in, in Australia. Okay. Um, so, so we've got fantastic um, access to, to you know, our consumers there as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's just a special spot to be. I, I grew up in Marlborough, so for me, okay. it's... Um, That's great. It, yeah, I sort of grew up in Marlborough, left and, and came back. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> You know, to be able to come back and work for such an, an exciting company that, yeah. you know, although we've been established uh, since 2005, I feel like it's, it's just really starting to get to that next level now. And, you know, the best is yet to come, must guys. be telling us. Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> um, and um, we've got another wine coming from you, uh, which is not arrived yet. I think, uh, well, all things being well, it will be with us sometime um, towards the end of March. Mm. Um, but uh, it's this called The Sound of White, and this is a wine which has uh, been aged a little bit more in oak, um, wild ferment, some malolactic. Uh, could you just tell us a few words about that, please? Yeah, sure. So obviously it comes from our vineyard, but it actually comes from a single block within the vineyard itself, and it's right at the base of our Pinot Noir on the hill. So it does have, um, you know, it's got, it's got more clay in the soil and tends to be quite uh, quite a structured wine, um, or the fruit that comes off there. We keep the yields really low and we only prune to two canes. So we're not going for that big Marlborough four cane, you know, quantity. We're, we're looking for quality essentially. And it's really simple from a winemaking perspective. Um, we, we really haven't quite touched on it yet, but that minimal intervention piece. Um, so we handpick the fruit for it, comes into the winery, it's chilled overnight. Um, it's just a whole bunch pressed, goes into tank with no enzymes, so no settling enzymes. So I want it kind of as cloudy as possible. And then only just a really small amount of sulfur at the tank. Um, so I want a bit of oxidation just for the juice initially but then it's protected once it gets to the tank. Just ambient settling over 24 hours and then racked straight into puncheons, uh, which are 500 litre barrels from there, um, mm. which are all older, so nothing new. Um, and then just for an indigenous ferment from there. So really just trying to keep as sort of hands off as, as possible with that wine and sort of let the site speak, but then you've got the, the winemaking influence um, from the barrel, but it's not about new oak, it's about yeah. texture and, yeah. and nuance and, and subtlety. Yeah, excellent. Well, we're, we're really looking forward to, uh, to, to uh, trying the sound of white when, uh, when, when that makes it over. But um, for now, we will uh, uh, enjoy, enjoy this. It's uh, shown really well. And um, we, uh, we, we're, we're out, out of time, unfortunately. We're going to have to jump to our next wine. But uh, it's been really lovely talking with you. And um, yeah, all the best for Vintage 2021. Yes, thanks very much, Mike. It's been been good to catch up nice with you and you. enjoy the wine. Yeah. Cheers, Matt. Thank you. Okay, so um, hopefully uh, you could all you could all see that, and um, it was great to be able to have that conversation some weeks back with uh, with with Matt Ward, the the winemaker there at Catalina Sounds, and uh, catch up with about his Sauvignon Blanc. We're now going to catch up uh, quickly with Saz, uh, who's all the way up in Scotland, and uh, and uh, yeah, have a say say hello with uh, with with Saz. So. Uh, it says, uh, take it away. Hi guys, um, near and far, good to see you and thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm going to talk to you about Adobe Gebert Straminer. Um, and I think for me, what resonates with this wine and Emiliana is their philosophy. And it's the philosophy is because we care. Um, and I think in this current climate, especially with things going on at the moment, um, that's one to be admired. Um, I was very privileged to go out to Chile and to visit Emiliana and the, the care that they have for their land, for their wine, for their workers is just phenomenal. And if I could go and work in that winery and live there, I would uh, 
I would go like a shot. Um, and it shines through in the Adobe Gewürztraminer, which you've got in your box. It's 2020. Um, it's got great concentration. Um, it's lovely, refreshing, really um, lovely ripe fruit. Um, and it's just generally really, really tasty. Um, I, I could quite happily sit with a pad thai um, and just watch the world go by and drink this and let it suck down very easily. Um, just, they did a re-label, um, a rebranding of the Adobe um, range and the cockerel is very significant um, on the label and the cockerel is called Juan or John in Scotland, as we would, I would, as we would call him. Um, and John used to follow um, the founder of Emiliana, who is called Hosey Gulstasti. I hope that's correct. Um, I used to follow um, Hosey and the workers around the vineyards um, because they'd feed him. And today it's really, it's very important for Emiliana that they still have roosters and hens in about the vineyards, in about the visitor centres, just kind of clucking away. So um, I hope you enjoy it. And it's been uh, lovely seeing you all virtually. Have a good day. Cheers. Thanks so much, Daz. Thank you. Um, she's absolutely right. It's a, a beautiful wine and, <clears throat> and beautiful people. We are going to uh, stay in Chile and we are going to talk to uh, the maestro himself, Felipe Muller. So, Felipe, we know that you could, uh, we could talk for hours and we could write book, books uh, about uh, what you know about Chile and wine. Um, but we have just 10 minutes, so here, a real challenge. And uh, we have a, a new wine to the range, uh, your, your Pinot Noir Rosé. So, um, yeah, if you could... Uh, Talk to us about uh, about your your uh, your experiments with Pinot Noir and, and uh, what we have in front of us. Okay, well, first of all, hi guys, it's a pleasure to to be with you today. And as you said, this is a new uh, product for a new one for the portfolio. Um, as some of the the, the audience uh, might know, um, Tavali is located in the Limari Valley, is in north of Chile. In Chile, the northern you go, the drier it gets and the warmer it gets. But this vineyard is planted very near the ocean, so it has a very strong influence of the cold Pacific Ocean breezes. Mm -hmm. And it's a very good start for Sauvignon Blanc, for Chardonnay, for Pinot Noir, for Cool Climate Syrah, etc. We've been, I would say, in Tavali, the biggest developers of the, of the valley, studying different areas of, of the Limari. And Pinot Noir has, has had a great adaptation to, to the area. And to be honest with you, uh, it took me a while to, to start producing some rosé, even though the category was growing worldwide, everywhere, you know, at probably double digit in terms of sales. But I used to make a rosé from Syrah, but to be honest with you, I was not very um, happy with the quality. Syrah from cool climate regions tends to get very re reductive. And here you have a kind of white wine fermentation, plus it's bottled with screw cup. So in terms of the aging, it wasn't a good, a good, a good wine in, from my perspective um, as a winemaker. So, but some years ago, I started making some sparkling wine. Uh, so I started picking earlier Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, and I realized that in the technique uh, in sparkling wine to avoid, you know, having a, a, a strong color extraction from the Pinot Noir grapes was very, was very good. And I was tasting the base wines of Pinot Noir for the sparkling wine and realized that in terms of aromatics of flavors and very, very light color, uh, the quality was amazing. So I said, well, maybe I have a chance to, to rethink, you know, the steel wine rosé. And of course, Pinot Noir is a, is a great variety to, to do it. But I would say that the, 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 the main difference in, of this wine is that I select some plots of uh, our vineyard and I manage them and I pick them especially for rosé. Many roses in the world, in Chile and in other countries, they, they do the senier, the bleeding, as we call it in Chile, sangrado, where you have a block of Syrah, Cabernet, Pinot Noir, whatever, for steel wine. And then you pick the grape in a more riper uh, style and you get the juice and you ferment it as a white wine. I think that Picking earlier, looking for a much more fresher start makes a huge difference. Plus that in Limari, in our case, we not only have a cool climate condition, which is very good for Pinot Noir, 
Uh, Limari is probably the only place in Chile where you find limestone soils. And limestone gives you a completely different aromatic and flavor character to the wine. Much more elegant, fresher, very good natural acidity, lower pH, higher acidity. And I would say a much longer aging potential of the wine. So plus this kind of technique I've learned from champagne producer uh, uh, in terms of, of making a long and very soft pressure, I was able to get a lovely light color, like very uh, rose, pale rose or pinky salmon, elegant, fresh, and lovely Pinot Noir. Um, Amazing. Yes, thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, that's a really comprehensive review of the wine. I think it's um, <laughs> amazing to think about the fact that this is uh, the champagne uh, technique used to make a, 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 a rosé, which is, uh, you know, a, a sort of a easily accessible drink. And um, what you also have in this wine is, as you say, that very pale color, which is incredibly important in the marketplace. First of all, that uh, customers are drawn towards this very pale style. But what the difference is for me is that you compare this to uh, many, many rosé uh, where trying this, this pale style, they don't have this fruit intensity that you have. You have the Chilean sunshine in here. You have this gorgeous strawberry, fruit character, which is really pleasurable, as well as the pale color and that lovely freshness and, and acidity. So um, yeah, we're, we're, very, we're very happy with it. Um, I, I just wondered if you might say a few words about the vineyard and the site itself, because that is quite a unique place. So that would be an interesting story to, to hear. Well, uh, Limari is a very special valley in Chile. As I mentioned before, it's, it's very far north up near to the desert. Technically speaking, Limari is a pre-desertic area. We have around 80 millimeters of rainfall per year, which is nothing, just two or three rains and that's it. But we have a lot of snow in the Andes, so we use that water for the irrigation. As Tavali, my, my winemaking philosophy is to try to show the terroir. We have great geological differences with Maipo, with Colchagua, Casablanca, Leda, other, other well-known valleys. And, and I would say it's a different view of, of Chile. And in, and in the case of Tavali, as a winemaker, I always say it, I, I don't like cooking a lot. If I have, don't like putting things uh, in, the, in, in my dish, in my recipe, if I have good ingredients, which in this case is a grape, I try to put that, those grapes inside a bottle with the style of the house. In, in my case, show terroir, show minerality, show that thing that is making us so different from the rest of Chile, which is the limestone soil. Um, and... Uh, and showing a fresher character, nice fruit driven, you know, uh, in this case, without any oak and, and coming out of the box from, from, from the country. So Limeri and Tavali adds quality, but also adds a lot of diversity from what you can expect from, from, from Chile. Uh, so, so, so we are a terroir focused winery. Uh, we, we are, uh, house that we produce around a million bottles per year of all the different ranges. In the case of this one, we produce 48,000 bottles. It's been quite interesting, the demand we have had. And uh, well, Pinot Noir grows fantastic in, in Limari. Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc is really, really at a very high level. And, and in this case, it's been a very nice surprise as, um, as again, as you said, you know, this, this elegant color, Plus, you know, these rose petals, some white strawberries in the mouth, a very good balance uh, in a pH that could easily have any Chardonnay or from, from cool climate areas. So all the way we do is, is to show quality. It doesn't matter the different wine ranges. Uh, and in this case, Pedregos is, is our starting point. I think we really show in a very precise way uh, the terroir we have, which is really fantastic. Absolutely. And that story is fascinating. And, and sometimes, you know, we may forget because uh, rosé is something that can be enjoyed on a, on a casual occasion or something that we don't need to think too hard about. But the reason why we don't have to think too hard about it is because of the effort that goes into making wines that have no rough edges, which have the fruit and the freshness. Um, so I think that's, um, that, that's you know, a, a brilliant thing to have and a, a huge effort and, and uh, experience which goes into it. Um, we just have a couple of minutes left, but I thought I couldn't let you go without um, saying a few words about some of the, the Pinot Noir, the reds that you make. So if you just tell us just a quick overview of maybe the, 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 uh, the Talanai Pinot Noir and, uh, and what the story is there, because we can't let you go without you talking about it. Yeah. Well, when I, when I started working in Tavali in 2006, 
we only had two red grapes and it was mainly Syrah and then a little bit of Pinot Noir. Uh, we've been developing, you know, we've been studying, we've been making a big research in terms of geology, climate and variety adaptation. And now we have a much wider portfolio with Cabernet Franc, with Merlot, with, um, of course, Syrah and Pinot Noir and, and also Malbec from, from cool climate condition. In the case of Pinot Noir, I, I would say that uh, I left, you know, many years ago, the, the Chilean way of making Pinot Noir. And I really started uh, moving, you know, my style into 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 a more fresher, uh, picking much earlier. Nowadays, my Pinot Noirs they move in 2007, 2008. They would have 14 degrees of alcohol. Now they have between 12 and the most 13 degrees. And picking earlier and working with more techniques with some percentages of whole bunch fermentation, depending on, on the wine. Uh, plus, you know, looking for the best sites with the most limestone and clay. We have, we have found a balance in, in the different Pinot Noirs we have, uh, which is really, really amazing. Uh, I think uh, Chile and Limari and, and, and Tavali, of course, we have a great, great opportunity of being uh, uh, very well known for, for very good quality Pinot Noir production. Pinot Noir is very sensible. If, from my perspective, if, I think that if you're in the place, you can do it. If not, you can have all the technology, all the knowledge, but it's so, so tough to, to have the quality. So, so, so in, in, uh, in Limari, we have that cool climate, a, a mixture of clay and limestone, which gives you much minerality into the wine, uh, more freshness, more aging potential. Uh, in the different cases, we have still, uh, we have Pinot Noir Pedregoso, still one, we have the Rosé, then we have Betas Blancas, and the High Talinai range, which, which has been really awarded for many, many years, and, and, and last year we released a top, top high-end Pinot Noir from a very specific parcel of, of Talinai again, which was which has, a, which has had really great comments and, and, and reviews from, 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 from the critics. So Absolutely. I think, I think Limarie is, 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 is leading in, in some ways the race uh, uh, in terms of quality in, in Pinot Noir, especially. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, you, you've definitely convinced uh, me, Felipe, and uh, you can be convinced us. So um, thank you so much for your time. We do have to move on, unfortunately, but we look forward to, to catching up with you again and, uh, and people are welcome to, to try your wines anytime. So uh, thank you for your time. And we are going to- Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll We're going to jump to France uh, to talk to uh, Guillaume. And Guillaume is going to talk to us about his very exciting um, Malbec project, uh, Le Volle. So, Guillaume, can you uh, turn on your microphone, uh, please? Yeah, you can. Uh, you could be all right. Hear us. We can hear you now. Yes. Uh, yeah. Bonjour. Hello. Hello. It's uh, so. Yes. If you could, um, we, we're really excited. Though. I, I, I think the Le Volle project is a really exciting one, um, a variety which is obviously hugely popular in in Argentina. But this wine um, has a really interesting story behind it. How you identified the the vineyards and so on and, and, and what you've done. So please, if you could tell us more about it. Hello, I'm Guillaume, French winemaker um, at Boutineau, especially for uh, home production uh, Boutineau product in, uh, in the south of France. So I am in charge of um, Les Volets range. So today we, we will speak um, uh, specifically about Malbec. Um, so I'm glad to, to present you this Malbec. And I, I'll start um, directly um, on the, the personality of this wine is, uh, is really uh, impacted by the, the climate and the area where we craft uh, this Malbec. Mm -hmm. um, so we are located in the south south of France, uh, probably one of the last vineyard in the um, last um, vineyard uh, in the south of France. We are uh, located just near Limoux, uh, famous for um, sparkling um, Blanquette de Limoux and uh, the AOP uh, Chardonnay Limoux. So uh, on, in Haute Vallée de l'Aude, um, Aude, it is the river uh, which passes through the, the area. We are located just at the foot of the Pyrenees. The Pyrenees, it's a massive chain of mountain which is the border between France and Spain. Uh, so this, this, um, this mountain has a, a huge impact on, on, uh, on the climate, obviously. 
as uh, we can find in, in Argentina with uh, Los Andes, for example. Um, so um, the, 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 the mountain, which is um, a, a huge lung of uh, fresh air during the night and during the, the, the evening, has a huge impact on the vineyard. Uh, we have two other big influences. Is uh, the two uh, we have the ocean influences, which bring uh, a lot of uh, humid and fresh air, and this fresh air follow the um, the mountain. Uh, and we have uh, Mediterranean uh, influences also, which bring hot uh, hot um, air. Excuse me. So, so that this, um, this combination of different uh, air bring some, uh, some humidity, humidity sometimes, some, some rain. So we are, we are in a perfect condition um, to, 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 to grow uh, Malbec. How, does that, uh, how do those conditions uh, influence what's in the glass? How does it uh, influence the, the grapes? Because it's quite, a, uh, it's quite a juicy style, I find, but also quite fresh. So is, is that responsible for that? Uh, yeah. The big, the big difference in comparison with the uh, Malbec uh, cultivated uh, inland, where it's very hot, because as I said, we are in the south of France. So even if I speak about cool climate, I, I would say it is um, a cooler climate di than inland. Uh, during the afternoon, it's very hot, uh, which is interesting in this area in Haute Vallée de l'Aude, is that we are in altitude. We have uh, influ different influences. And as, um, we have alternation between the hot uh, afternoon and as soon as the sun goes down, um, we have fresh air from the mountain, from the sea, from the, the altitude where we, we are cultivated Malbec. Uh, for this wine, we are located roughly between three and 400 um, meters. It's not huge in terms of altitude, but we are really at the foot of the Pyrenees. And so, how did you identify, sorry to, to jump in there, how did you identify this vineyard site? Um, why did you decide to make Malbec single variety? Because often they would go into blends and, and be used for other things. So why did you identify this particular area? Uh, I, I listened to Philippe uh, previously and uh, we, we started uh, like him for, for Pinot Noir and for Chardonnay. Um, I, I am a native from uh, Burgundy, so I wanted to craft it uh, some good Pinot Noir and good Chardonnay in the south of France with liveliness, with freshness. So um, we, started, we started to work over there for, uh, on this area for um, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. And after that, we, we finished on Malbec. Um, and uh, as, a, as a, a, I wanted to explain is that the alternation between the hot climate and the cool climate during the night and the evening permit to have to this Malbec uh, a, a long but and slow but complete ripeness. And uh, this complete ripeness has a huge impact on the quality of the polyphenol. So the tannin, the mouthfeel, and, uh, and the liveliness, obviously. Uh, that's why we have a Malbec with a lot of crunchiness. Uh, and um, it's completely different than Malbec uh, in hot region. Uh, where uh, the main problem is that we have a lot of concentration, so a lot of potential uh, high ABV. So we already, uh, with a jammy flavor uh, and high alcohol container, yep. in this Malbec, we are at 13 um, uh, alcohol container. So okay, yeah. it's refreshing, it's very crunchy, very focused on the blueberry. It is uh, the, the, the flagship of, uh, of this wine. Absolutely. And uh, I think that makes it lovely because it's approachable for, for customers uh, um, by the glass. You know, they don't, don't have to have it with food, for example, because uh, it's, it's still so uh, you know, lovely and approachable. And um, if we move to the winery, what are some of the things that you do in the winery? How is the, the wine made and, and what's the story there? Uh, regarding the, the winery, um, basically we are really, for, for Malbec we are really focused on, on the selection of the, um, the grape, se selection of the, the, the fruit. We try to to pick the, the fruit at the optimum ripeness. After that, uh, just to, to keep the acidity, uh, keep a slow sugar container, 
Um, and in terms of wine making process, I, I would say we the big job is in the vineyard. After that, we are on the classic maceration between two or three weeks, depend on the vintage, depend on the plot, uh, with a small pumping over. We don't push too hard because we, we try to, 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 to work on silky uh, tannin. Um, and um, and uh, Malbec is, um, is a rough grape variety. You can't afford to push too hard if you want to, to highlight the, the fruit, the blueberry nuts, and the, the, the quality of the tannin. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. No, that, that, uh, that makes sense. And again, for, for me, and I think it's important that we uh, to tell this message that even though these wines are at sort of everyday price points, um, that there is a huge amount of effort and attention that goes into selecting the right vineyard, the careful harvest, the, the, the attention in the, in the winery. Um, so um, I think that's, I think that's, that's brilliant. And, and there are other, other wines in the range, as you say, that the Pinot Noir and the Chardonnay and other things for people to, to taste. Um, unfortunately, uh, Guillaume, we must move on uh, the, because of the, 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 the time is, uh, is ticking on. So we, we need to move to our next one. But thank you so much for, for talking about to us. Thank you. thank you. OK, goodbye. And hello to Rebecca, who is in London. So Rebecca um, looks after th things for us, uh, all things to do with London. So uh, yeah, Rebecca, if you'd like to say hello. will show you on the screen hopefully um, and this is just one for you to taste a little bit later so this is produced by winemaker um, Jean-Luc Mordon he is now the fifth generation of his family to run this estate the estate itself is 45 hectares um, uh, all sort of managed sustainably in the area of terrain in Loire so obviously, like most Gamay, this has gone through carbonic maceration and it is um, completely unoaked style. So it's really youthful, bright, crisp flavor. Um, what I love about Gamay is it's the perfect summer wine. While there will always be a place for your sort of heavier reds, your Riocas and your Passamentos, I think going into what will, fingers crossed, be a nice sunny summer for us, it's just nice to have something that's a little bit more approachable, softer and just easier to drink. Um, this one pairs really nicely with charcuterie and cheeses or, to be perfectly honest, quite often just being sat with a glass by itself. I don't think it necessarily needs to have food with it just because it is so easy going. Um, so I hope you all enjoy tasting it a little bit later on. Uh, sorry, I didn't have a bottle to hand. No, that's, that's fine. No, thank you very much, Becca. And uh, yeah, thank you for the, the, the run through of the wine. So no, I agree. A, a lovely sort of summer red and something people could uh, even have uh, chilled potentially. So uh, thanks to you, Becca. We'll, we'll catch you later on. And uh, we are now whizzing off to Spain uh, to talk to Guillermo. And I'm um, uh, um, yeah, excited to talk about uh, Borsal and uh, the, the wines that they make there. So Guillermo, uh, hello. Hello, everybody. How are you? Yes, very good. Thank you. Very good. And, and nice to be Nice to be talking with, uh, with, with you today. Um, one thing that I think that, um, you know, obviously we can't say everything, but maybe something that I, I would find really interesting to, to hear is um, why Garnacha and why Campo de Boca? What is the story that, um, that people need to know? Um, and uh, what is it that makes your wine so special there? Yeah, actually the history here in the region uh, comes from uh, uh, eight or nine centuries ago when the monks from the monastery of Berbala, just 15 kilometers away, started to plant the garnacha in the area. So it was, it, it is so widely known that the garnacha comes from this area. I don't know from Campo de Borja or from uh, any other area around, but uh, the garnacha is, uh, is the autochthon variety, the local variety. And it's uh, very well adapted to the, to the weather, to the climate, to the terroir of Campo de Borja. Um, Campo de Borja, uh, where, the, where this wine comes from, is, um, is located in the northeast area of Spain, just uh, below Rioja. Uh, but it's uh, quite warmer than uh, Rioja, uh, very windy. And uh, it's surrounded by the mountain of uh, Moncayo. So uh, we have different areas at different altitudes. So uh, as, you, as you may know, the terroirs are, are also very different and, 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 the, and the balance between them is the secret for our wines. 
we have uh, vine years at 800 meters and uh, all the vine years at uh, less than 300. So uh, depending on the, on the um, vintage, we can use more uh, ganachas coming from the highest areas or from the lowest. And this wine, uh, the Borsal selection is uh, blending mainly garnacha, but also uh, some Tempranillos and Syrah, around uh, 50% between uh, the two of them. Uh, coming from uh, the three different areas, okay? From uh, Pozuelo, Tabuenca, and uh, Borja. It is an, an oak wine. We don't use uh, the barrels for it. It's uh, only st stainless steel tanks used for it. But the wine has complexity uh, because of uh, the origin of the grapes. And because we, uh, we try to make the the maceration and the fermentation by plot and by terroir. So the garnachas from uh, the highest area are uh, blended with the, with the other garnachas just in the end, just in the final blend. Uh, we make a tasting uh, between the team of winemakers and the commercial team and decide the final blend of uh, this wine, which is a total success for us for the last 20 years uh, all over the world being also one of the um, one of the most awarded wines in the winery despite of it has no no oak okay Excellent. yeah well thank you now that's that's a that's a really uh, good overview i know it's, it's not easy to to do uh, tell tell a life story more or less in about three minutes but um i think that um you know garnacha is a variety which is perhaps sometimes uh, overlooked in terms of its quality and i think that perhaps it's because it exists in some uh, maybe uh, poorer parts of Europe historically, or whether that's a variety which was maybe grown in the wrong place or was overcropped or, and, and so on. Um, but I think what that represents is amazing value for money compared to, um, you know, other varieties like, like uh, they're more well-known um, like Shiraz or, or anything, uh, other, some other varieties. So, but what people are getting is this delicious sort of rich uh, uh, flavor profile. And, um, yeah, I just wondered if uh, you could tell us about the selection on range. Uh, where does that sit within the within Borsal and um, and and where, how does that fit within the, the different categories? Yeah, well, one of the secrets uh, for the ganacha to be uh, to be good good quality um, is, in my opinion, is the yield. Okay, we are working with only four thousand uh, kilograms per hectare, which is a very low yield for this wine. Remember, uh, young wine. Uh, instead of using 8,000 or 7,000 or 9,000, which is used in other areas of, of uh, even in Spain, okay? Uh, but we don't irrigate uh, too much. We try to keep this low yield to maintain the quality and the concentration of the grape. And the result is very fruity, very intense, and, uh, and also fresh because the ganacha, the intense ganacha hasn't been very very ripe or overripe i mean mm. well the selection range for us um has three different wines uh the rosé the white and the red the the white is made with uh, macabeo and uh, chardonnay uh, the rosé is ganacha and also the red is ganacha with a touch of uh, syrah and uh, and uh, the uh, tempranillo and uh, in my opinion, they reflect the, the, real, uh, the real characteristics of the area, okay? Because we, when we oak the wine, we can make some, um, you know, some, uh, we, we can use different aromas to, 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 for the wine, but uh, with this kind of wines, we don't, uh, we just express the pureness of, of, the, of the varieties. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I, I've, uh, I've I've never been to Campo de Boca, but I've just seen the pictures of the um, the amazingly dry vineyards, just patches of stones and uh, big spaces between the vines because it's so dry. So um, it seems like a, a uh, yeah a remarkable place to 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 make wine. And uh, how was the uh, how was the last vintage for you? How did you get on in in two thousand and twenty making the wines? Well. 2020 wasn't a very happy year for for most of the people, but for us, in terms of uh, of the vintage, it was it was great because uh, sometimes when a, when a vintage is good for the winemakers, it's in good for the the vine growers. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, the 2020 was was great for both. Uh, we had uh, medium high quantity of uh, of grapes uh, and also a very high quality. Uh, above all for the ganacha, we had a lot of uh, snow and, and and rain in the um, in the spring. And then, despite of the summer was really hot, the the plants had uh, this this water, uh, so they can they could. Uh, ripe the granatas slowly and, and uh, the result was fantastic. Amazing. And um, just to maybe change tack slightly, uh, we're always looking for inspiration for some uh, food and wine pairing ideas, but perhaps the best thing to do is to drink the wines of the region with the foods that they have in the region. So um, what would be your perfect Spanish pairing with, uh, with this wine? Well, this kind of wine is not, not only my wine, but this kind of wines, young wines, uh, are perfect for, for tapas because when you go on tapas, you never know what's going to happen. You, you can eat uh, tortilla, you can eat uh, jamón, you can eat uh, salad, uh, some, some meat, whatever. So these kind of wines can pair with a different kind of food. And that's fantastic. Uh, or if, you, if you're going, for instance, with, for a barbecue in summertime, uh, and uh, and you're bringing some salads and other other people is, is doing some uh, sticks or whatever in the barbecue. You can pair this wine with it uh, perfectly. Mm -hmm. Amazing, yeah, no, it definitely. Uh, well, we we all certainly can't wait for the uh, the opportunity to uh, to have the friends over and have some tapas and uh, have some of the uh, your your ganache from the selection. So. That would be brilliant. And you got a, a silver medal from uh, Decanter as well for this wine, which for the price is, is, is amazing. I, I, um, it, it's, it's such a difficult competition and the standard of judges is so high. So it must be really rewarding that, you know, that these wines that you, you get that recognition. Yeah, it's, it's a very awarded wine. In fact, it had uh, 91 points, if I don't remember, from uh, Sackling, the, the 90 and silver medal from, from Decanter. It's a wine that everybody loves. I mean, uh, it's it's a funny wine because it's not very complex, but it has the balance. It has a fruit, the spice. Just delicious, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it's, it's it's a wine to drink a bottle. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. We, we we agree entirely. So maybe we'll do that afterwards. But uh, um, we have to go, unfortunately, Guillermo. But thank you so much for your time, and um, you. hope we can see you soon. And uh, we are going to have to move on. But thanks again. Uh, we are we are uh, now going to, uh, to the uh, from uh, sunny Spain to the East Midlands uh, to talk to Ed Fancourt and uh, Ed. Hello, if you could uh, yeah in introduce the the wine and, and uh, say hello. Yeah, hi Mike. Thanks for that. Can everyone hear me? All right. We can hear. Yeah. Good. Cool. Okay. So um, thanks everyone for tuning in or watching it on record. Um, and I'm just my name's Ed Fancourt. Some of you will know me. I've been around Butano for. God, 14 years now, slightly worryingly. Um, and I look after the East Midlands and the East of England. Um, the wine I'm going to talk to you guys about, um, my bottle's also in Carl's recycling bin as well, unfortunately, um, is the uh, Not Knock Shiraz. Thanks, Mike, you must have known. Not Knock Shiraz 2018. Um, so a quick word about what we're doing over there. So um, as you probably know with Butano, we like to get involved with our producers um, at a fairly sort of intimate level. And, um, and the, the project that we've had in the Barossa is, is an evolving thing. We've been involved now for 10 years, starting with a wine called Black Craft Shiraz. Um, Knock Knock is something that was made in collaboration with the legendary Rolf Binder. Um, and it comes from a, a number of parcels which he has access to. The primary one, and the main one being in the northern part of the Barossa. Um, which is a locality known, well known as Ebenezer. So some of you will have heard of Ebenezer Shiraz's, they can be really eye-wateringly expensive. You're looking at sort of 20 quid plus a bottle easily. Um, and that's an extension of the Kalimna region. Um, and Kalimna is again, well known. Penfold's been 28, very famous wine that um, they've made very high quality. Uh, so you're, you're talking something that's pretty high end in terms of its provenance really. Um, the area benefits from quite a sandy soil and that gives a elegance and perfume. Uh, don't get me wrong, you know, this is Barossa Shiraz. It's, it's, not, um, it's not sort of weedy and thin. It's always gonna be a, a big, big wine, but the, uh, the sandiness of the soil just allows that sort of perfume and elegance to sort of come through. There's a 3% of Grenache in the blend as well, just to, just to give it a little bit of lift. And it spends 20 months in new, 30% um, new 
and 70% older oak. Um, and I was talking to Rolf about this, this is a while back now, and he said that he regards oak as a, a seasoning rather than a flavoring, which was a, a line that I quite liked. Um, 2018 is a um, small, small harvest. Um, believe it or not, even in somewhere as hot as the Barossa, you can get frost and they were frost affected, which kept the yield down. So that's the reason you've got such amazing concentration. Um, and, and really that line, you can sit on it for five, 10 years, no worries at all. So, um, so yeah, basically what you've got there is a pretty premium Barossa Shiraz at an unpremium price. And I hope you like it. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. And it's, uh, it's great to be able to get that out there at, uh, at such good value. So thank you for, for sharing that with us. And um, we're going to move now to our final wine. And we are going to talk um, with uh, Eduardo Montresor about um, our new, uh, well, a relatively new wine for us, the, the Urban Park. So um, Eduardo, uh, hello. Hello, ciao, Mike. Ciao, Andy. It's nice a big virtual hug from my 21st days in quarantine. Yes, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's good to you know that. Thank, thank goodness for modern technology. You can be in quarantine and we can still, we can still have this conversation. But um, hopefully we are all moving towards happier things and better times. So um, certainly this wine will give us the opportunity to do that. So um, I'd like to uh, really, there's, there's so many questions with this wine, a lot to get into. But what I'd like to ask you about is just to give us the... Um, why you wanted to make this a this, this particular wine? What is the story with this wine and the sort of the packaging the style um, from a region which has a long history of making a Passamento style? So, yeah. Yes, it's um, it's something new in the, in the Montezor portfolio because it's a wine that connected the uh, tradition of uh, my family. It's uh, the, the, the company was founded from my great grandfather in the 1892, so more than 120 years. And at the same time, is combined with uh, with the something new. It's uh, the the old part of the wine is that we decide to use the typical grapes that normally uh, we use for making the most famous wine as Amarone and Ripasso. So Corvina, Corvinone, Rondinella, three autochton varietal of Valpolicella, Valpolicella area. And uh, this wine is uh, made with uh, selected grapes by hand. And uh, we pick it in the perfect timing when uh, the grapes are a little bit uh, ripeness. And uh, we put the, the grapes in the single box to dry out for uh, a long 30, 45 days. The, the, the grapes are crushed after and fermented, fermented in sta uh, stainless steel uh, vats. After the process, uh, we, we put the wine in the big cask wooden cask of 55 hectoliter as a Montezor tradition to refine the wine. And uh, this process gives to the wine a super nice balance. I think that the, the tricks, uh, of course, is the packaging, but is uh, the style of wine. So it's a good mix uh, between uh, a really full body, really round in the mouth, but uh, with uh, the typical point of acidity of Valpolicella. This uh, permit to, uh, to attain a wine that it's really elegant and uh, really easy drinking. So it's perfect uh, combined with the food. You know that the key of uh, Italian wine that we make a wine for food, not only for pleasure. Yes. Okay, this day of quarantine is a pleasure, but tell me. It's an ingredient in the meal. It's not a, uh, it's, it's, it's part of a meal. It's not a, it's not a standalone thing. Yes. The, the idea is, uh, you know, that in Italy we have many different types of wine because every wine follows the different uh, typical recipe of the area. Like for in Mahara, we have many different types and many different wines, of course. But you said before that uh, uh, something about packaging. Yes, because this, this wine is, uh, was created in, um, in, in a different way. Normally you start from the wine and then you create the label. In this case, we start from uh, uh, paint, because uh, my family uh, has always considered the, the, the wine an expression of art, like the music or the visual arts uh, in, in a more classic style and more modern forms. Is as uh, your um, uh, artist, uh, Robert Louis Stevenson said, uh, wrote in the past that wine is music in the bottle. So the same philosophy is the philosophy that has had my family from different generation. And in 2000, 
we decided to create a communion between the ancient place of our cellar. Never forget that the, the winery was built in the end of 19th century, so it's really old, and uh, a modern and revolutionary form of heart. What do we did? We opened the, um, the doors, the gate of the deep cellar to the street artists, the famous writers that in Italy, but imagine in UK too, is uh, not legal people. So it's not legal uh, paint the wall in the city. So we decided to open the door, giving to these artists the opportunity to feel uh, free, to express uh, the, the, the talent. And uh, one of the, the result of this, uh, this uh, thing that we decide is the murales that uh, is located in the underground cellar, a 25 meter under the ground, where uh, normally we uh, refine and age the Amarone, the Ripasso, and uh, was made from uh, an uh, Italian artist, Sebastiano Zanetti. And uh, we take uh, the, um, the inspiration from these uh, murales to make this wine. What do we did? We, uh, we saw the colors. The idea that I had was to do the, the video, the, the testing from the seller, but I can't go. So no. <laughs> okay. maybe you can check the picture on the internet. And uh, so we, we take the sensation that you have looking the the murales and touching the murales because the murales is made on the concrete tank that is the, 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 the basement of the, the winery. So it's a little bit rusty. And uh, from this art, we take uh, inspiration to make the wine. And uh, to make, to do more deeper the connection, we, we did uh, the impossible to make the label. Because uh, I don't know if you have the, the, the possibility to touch the label, you have the same sensation mm. that you can have touching the, the, um, the wall. But at the same time, it is uh, yeah, rusty, so a little bit. Um, you can feel the, the, the concrete, yes. but at the same time it's smooth, has the wine. So it, it was a, a crazy thing that, of course, the first vintage that we released was uh, the vintage that you are testing, that 2018, mm -hmm. that for the Valpolicella was a great, um, great uh, vintage because we have a really balanced uh, here. And uh, we was uh, super happy about the, the result. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, it uh, was, uh, I was really proud because we received a different award. So we received 90 point uh, from uh, Jane Sacklin. So, you know, that is not the, the perfect average for Mr. Sacklin, the Valpolicella. So 90 yeah. point for a Valpolicella wine is, uh, is a great result. And um, this wine, I forgot to tell you, it's, uh, it's an appassimento, of course, because we dry the grapes. But it's a it's a really a passimento in the sense that is a IGP, so uh, protect uh, um, geographical uh, indication, uh, IGP Veneto. So means that all the grapes came from the from the area of Veneto, from the area of Valpolicella. This, uh, you know that of course it's um, I came from this area, so I'm totally love from the terroir and from the soil from the grapes the, um, of the Valpolicella, Corvina, Corvinone, Rondinella and Molinara. But these grapes are really uh, important to understand uh, this type of wine because uh, you know that um, in, uh, in the expression of Amarone, when you dry 100% of the grapes for five, six months, you obtain a really rich wine, but at the same time with a nice, nice acidity, a really um, easy drinking uh, way. This is the same philosophy of the wine Urban Park. So it's a concentration with a really sweetness in the mouth that came from a little bit of sugar, residual sugar inside, but the big part of the sweetness came from the fruitness that we obtained with the dry system. So we can have the typical uh, flavor of the Valpolicella. You feel the balsamic, fruity, spicy, and uh, the color is really ruby, red is intense, consistent. So it's, uh, I think that it's a really curious wine that you can uh, discover uh, step by step in the glass and really open for pairing uh, with the food. It's, uh, it's um, just, to, just to interrupt there, I find, uh, just, uh, just to ask a question rather, I think that in terms of many Passamento styles that I've tried, it's, it's, it's fairly dry. Like it seems like there's not uh, such a, 
a high amount of sugar. What is the sugar number uh, residuals? What is the residual? It's less than, it's around 6, uh, 6.5 gram a liter. Because so really, some can be 10 or 11, 12 kind of grams uh, that we find. It can be a bit too much. Yes, I think that uh, in, in the market now, you can find many different appassimento from different regions of, uh, of Italy. I think that the, the, the you know the the, the passimento method started born in the Vapolicella for a, for for a simple reason because uh, the varietal everything came from the nature so the Corvina Rondinella and Molinara too is grapes uh, is varietal that is perfect for drying because they maintain the of course the body the roundness so with the, with the, with the dry system they will be re, uh, richer compared to the normal grapes. But at the same time, because they have a really big skin, so we can dry for a long time, we can maintain a lot of acidity. Yeah. And these uh, help to, to balance the wine. And in the philosophy of Montresor is, uh, we never uh, believe in the high content of sugar because you lose totally the opportunity to balance in the right way the food. What I love in this wine is that uh, uh, that is good for me because I am the producer. It's uh, when you finish the glass, you can drink another one. Absolutely, absolutely. Eduardo, look, thank you so much. Uh, we, we do have to, uh, to, to uh, begin to wrap up, unfortunately, but I, I just wanted to summarize kind of what you said. Thank you, so many interesting things, but- A pleasure. Think, yeah, absolutely, that was great. And, and, and I think that what's interesting is that the, the label, I didn't really know that story behind it, but it means that if you're interested to try the new modern style of uh, Valpolicella in the same way you're willing to try the new modern style of art, those two things go, go together, really well crafted. So uh, a brilliant story and uh, thank you for sharing it with us. Thank you, Mike. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank Bye. You. Um, we are going to now uh, wrap up and uh, there have been a few internet connections in the, uh, in the wilds of the Lake District, uh, internet connection problems in the wilds of the Lake District. But someone we couldn't uh, leave without uh, talking to and, uh, and giving some closing thoughts. Uh, Deborah, Deborah Brooks, I'm sure, is well known to you all. So, uh, Deb, if you could uh, give us some closing thoughts, if you can, if you can hear us. Oh my God! Oh, hi, hi, everyone. Sorry, I know I can't see you, but um, yeah, I'm really sorry. We've uh, we've been told today by the uh, BT engineer that we need to have a new telegraph pole, telegraphone pole in our uh, probably in our garden. So my husband's quite keen to you know find out how much that's. Uh, we can we can rent that uh, space out for anyway really sorry but um yeah it, it hopefully <laughs> you know hopefully you got something out of this and you know i guess just some just some things to say obviously you know and some thank yous obviously for today it's been i know it's been an, a, a a bit of a, a, a rites of passage for you know the it guys uh, but the last sort of like few months has um, in terms of getting virtual tastings up and running um so thanks for, you know, for, for, for uh, Steve and, and Mike and all that. I could do an Oscar speech. But I suppose, you know, one of the things that um, I would like to say is it's it's been a, <laughs> obviously a crazy year. It's been amazing to, uh, to, to uh, I suppose, um, you know, have really, really look at the relationships that we've got with our customers, which has been, um, which, which which have always been fantastic, but but continue to be. It's been it's it's really shone a, a light on on the amazing, I suppose, um, you know, the amazing support that you guys have given us. Um, one of the things that we've found certainly in this last uh, twelve months in the pandemic, and I'm sure everybody's uh, saying the same, it's been in a massive readaptation. I mean, otherwise, you know, look at us here speaking to to um, to to screens. Um, great thing is that we've been able to keep stay connected that's one thing you know stay connected with our producers which has been fantastic and our customers and you know i'm sure some of that will will stick um but you know generally just a readaptation and 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 i think a bit of a renewal as well so so i, I don't i've always been a great believer in that in things aren't going to be the same you know after after this i'm not saying that everything's going to change massively but you know we've we've uh we've We've just found different ways of connecting and different ways of of, uh, of of trading, I guess, just like you guys have. So it's 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 been fantastic to see this last year. And thank all I want to say is thank you for your support. It's been it's been amazing. And thank you for the to the producers, 
And um, yeah, we hope we'll hope you know to see you very soon. Um, we are thinking of doing a September tasting. I don't know what people think about that, but we are looking at you know doing things uh, physically so that we can all air kiss again and uh, do all the things that we do at tastings and share insights, aka gossip. So, um, <laughs> so uh, thanks again. Sorry, I missed most of it, but you know, broadband has been rubbish up in the up in Cumbria. So um, yeah, thank, and thanks, thanks to you guys, you know, to, to, to Mike and to, to Andy and to Mark and Steve behind the, the, the scenes and to all the team and of course the producers. So thank you. So lovely summary, Deb. Thanks so much. And uh, yeah, uh, thank you for, for watching the video either live or on the recording and, and uh, looking forward to getting out on the road and, and, and uh, tasting with you all again. And uh, thanks to uh, the producers all around the world. I am absolutely thrilled that that worked and didn't fall over. Uh, so um, yeah, we'll, we'll see you hopefully shortly in, in real life. Let's get out there and uh, get some great wine and some glasses. So um, that's it from us. And uh, we'll see you hopefully for real. Goodbye. Thank you. Cheers.